we have a lot of people who are normal weight or, or underweight who are food addicts. Really, what is the definition of food addiction but somebody who's obsessed by food to the point where it's obtrusive into the rest of their life and that they have behaviors, compulsions that damage their normal circumstances, like they don't go into work, they uh, cancel things, that sort of thing. And they simply cannot stop. And that can be anybody. That can be a thin person who's over-exercising. That can be a person who's got a secret um, bulimic behavior where they, they um, uh, you know, get rid of all the food that they put into their mouth. Or, the, or they do all sorts of tricks around eating. It's called sham eating, where you eat but you don't really swallow it. Like there's, there's all sorts of things that a skinny person can do. Food Addiction is a podcast which explores the disease of food addiction and presents the solution. We interview professionals and counselors who specialize in the disease of food addiction, and we interview individuals who have successfully recovered from food addiction and discuss how they did it. Esther Helga Goodmans Dotier was motivated to change careers after she recovered from food addiction by opening a food addiction treatment center and the INFAC school the world's first and only sugar and food addiction counseling training, which offers a recognized certification. Check out the website for more information on obtaining this certification, as well as proven recovery programs at infactschool.com. Listen to these episodes as we discuss the problem and the solution around food addiction. I'm Susan Branscombe. I am a recovered food addict and the host of this podcast food addiction, which is sponsored by the Infact School. I want to welcome our guest today, Dr. Vera Tarman. Welcome, Vera. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susan, for asking me to come yeah. here. Great to have you here. I can't wait to dive in. I'm going to read your bio, and then we'll dive into some questions. Dr. Vera Tarman, MD, is the medical director of Renaissance, one of Canada's largest treatment centers for substance abuse. Dr. Tarman is a highly respected authority on diagnosing and treating food addiction. She is an addiction specialist, having worked in addiction medicine for over 30 years and is committed to her patient's care and recovery. Dr. Tarman has lived the food addiction experience herself. She is a recovering food addict who has maintained a 100-pound weight loss for more than 15 years. She is an internationally renowned expert on sugar and food addiction. She writes and speaks and treats people who suffer from sugar addiction, food addiction, and those who seek food recovery. Dr. Tarman is the author of Food Junkies, Recovery from Addiction, which I have read. It's a very good book. And she hosts the Food Junkies podcast, runs uh, educational workshops, and is a featured speaker at medical and academic conferences. So welcome again, Vera. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Excited to talk about the subject. Yeah, yeah, and so am I. Uh, talk about your work. You're a medical director at Renaissance. Uh, you write, you do a podcast. Talk about your work around being a medical professional and addiction counselor. Um, okay, so I, I've been working in the field of addiction since I think 2004 and I've been a doctor since 19. 19- 98 or maybe 2000 i don't know my, my anyway long time um and uh i uh got into the field of addiction and then fairly quickly got into working at renaissance which is a treatment center of uh, three residences across ontario um uh, and we looked at, at uh, drugs and alcohol addiction but we did have for three years a food addiction program uh, thanks to a donor who uh, funded it and so i have a bit of experience in a residential setting of course COVID it closed that off and then we haven't been able to pick it up but that's sort of my background that's my sort of professional work i also work at a place called salvation army so i do a lot of sort of um street level addiction work and i do a lot of stuff on the side like this podcast and and uh, facebook group which um i'd like to mention later um uh, basically doing uh to, to get this area of food addiction up in the in the uh, public domain yeah right yeah, I want to I want to talk about the disease of food addiction. I'm a food addict, and um, I'm helping uh, Esther Helga Goodman's Dotier, the Infact School, with this podcast. And mm-hmm. I know you have a Food Junkies podcast. It's very good. Uh, I want to start with a quote from your book. You say the message is simple: If you see yourself as a food addict, you must treat your trigger foods as drugs. The most successful treatment for any drug addiction from alcohol or drugs or food is abstinence from the trigger substance. Our addicted brain, whether it is genetic, psychological, or even environmental, 
for those reasons, is wired to crave more as soon as even the smallest amount has entered our system. Like a flame igniting kindling, trigger foods ignite a fiery and voracious appetite that makes us want to eat, 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 which is true in my case. And uh, talk talk about that. It's profound. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, really what that that quote is trying to emphasize, as is the book, and is most of the people, of, uh, those of us who are in the field speaking, is to say that this is an actual physiological, biological phenomenon. It's not um, a, a matter of willpower. It's not even a psychological alone thing, like an eating disorder, where you you know you're using food to deal with something else. It's actually a physical phenomena, and it's it's a uh, it can be measured um, uh, in the sense of it has been measured in, t- in the sense of using spec scans and whatnot and also it, it becomes a clinical syndrome it's something that we see uh in in practice all the time and it's the same type of features uh, so it, it it's really to say that this is i don't like the word disease but it's a physiological disorder premised yes. on something that's happened in um in our neurochemistry largely thanks to the food industry Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about that. Um, talk about the lack of understanding in our society and mm-hmm. doctors. Uh, I mean, my doctor, I would go in, you've got to lose weight, Susan, you're diabetic, you weigh 200 plus pounds. Uh, and professionals who believe that we just need to eat more moderately, just eat healthier foods, just yeah. exercise more frequently, um, deal with emotional things, just lose weight. But it is not about that. It is not about willpower. Talk about that. Yeah, the, the, the general view, the general medical view, um, unfortunately, um, uh, it, it's it's pretty firm as as most medical um, attitudes are, and it, they feel that they've sort of understood or they're, what they're trying to understand using a model that um, I call the hormonal model or the sort of normal model of eating that has been deranged. Through, uh, due to the food industry, um, and so, and, and then there's also the the psychological model, which is the um, uh, eating disorder model. And and using those two models, uh, doctors and the medical profession at large feel that they've got they understand what's going on, and that is the eat less and um, exercise more uh, paradigm. And so we are are in the unfortunate position of having to show that we are different than that because they, in a sense, came first, um, or they dominate the field first and 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 we, we cannot get away from the economics the political economical angle that's what the food industry wants us to sit with is that so all the the medications all the research that's coming out is all focused on those two models and there we are um newcomers to the field saying uh well, actually we're not that new but we are in the medical world uh saying look there's another model yours is right but there's ours as well and and physicians just don't want to go there and until the um it's called the standard of practice practice until research, until uh, education, and uh, the higher-ups, the, the universities, etc., that, that, that tell us what we should do, that set our guidelines, um, until they change, doctors are more likely to say, I'm, I'm not going, that's extreme, that's odd, right. we're going to go with the standard care model. Right. Yeah. There's a total blame the victim kind of thing. Like, Susan, why can't you lose weight? And, Mm -hmm. you know, you and I share this, you know, we were successful in different things. You give me something to do, a problem, uh, something to do, I will fix it. That one I couldn't fix, you know, and there's a whole blame the victim, you know, why can't you just stop? And my husband used to say, why can't you just moderate your food? I'm like, I don't know. And the thing is, I ingest sugar, I ingest processed foods. I couldn't stop when I started. Right. And you know, it, it's, it's very similar to somebody saying, um, you're depressed. Why don't you just be happy? You know, like, right. why don't you just get over you it? Know, yeah. Get over it and do something. And the person who's depressed or who's anxious, uh, saying, I don't know why, but I can't. Like, there's something that's happening. Um, uh, physiologically, there's something that's happening. And until that's addressed, you can just yell at me and all, all I'll do is feel shamed. So yeah. yes, it's, it's, and, and you know, the whole depression model, uh, for example, in psychiatry, it is essentially a blaming the victim model. Uh, and then we, we treat the victim, but we don't look at the external causes, which mm-hmm. by the way, could be food as one thing, but it's also things like in our society that, uh, you know, we just, it's, it's very difficult, um, to have, uh, I don't know, especially since COVID and, and you know, uh, climate change, et cetera, there's a lot of things that, that, 
that stress our psych our psychology and if we don't address that it is essentially blaming the victim so we're, we're right. essentially looking we're comparing the more resilient people um or in the case of food addiction the non-food addicts with the food addicts and that's just so unfair because it's not mm -hmm. recognizing that you and i have a different biology and it may not be a genetic although genetics is definitely a, a role in it it could just be exposure uh to you know we're pre pre we're vulnerable to something and now something has changed that makes me right. different than the non uh, food addict right yeah. you cite a quote from Kay shepherd's book which i've read food addiction the body knows mm. and she says something really good here on um, you cite this in your book food addiction is a chronic progressive and ultimately fatal disease it is chronic because the condition never goes away it is progressive because the symptoms always get worse over time and is fatal because those of us who persist in the disease of food addiction will die in early death to, due to its complications. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you know, Kay Shepard is a pioneer in the field, and and those of us who are you know in the field now, uh, you know, bow to you know what we call the the, gi the giants. The, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and she's one of the giants. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, y yes, it's that, and this is the thing that. The medical profession doesn't like to see is that we're saying not only is there a physiological change but actually a condition develops this food addiction syndrome and and in the same way as um other conditions like diabetes are chronic and progressive so is food addiction in fact i think there's an actual parallel where we're now starting to talk about that possibility between diabetes pre-diabetes pre-food addiction diabetes food addiction like there's a similar parallel uh, an association not, not a causation but an association which is very interesting anyway that it's a chronic progressive condition and if you don't quote we say this in the addiction world get off the bus sooner you're going to ride to the end of the bus which is death and that's the same um death driven uh, by compulsion and inability to stop this, these are the features of addiction that happen with um tobacco cigarettes or pardon me um, um alcohol opiate use cocaine use all right. of them if you continue to use the substance it, it gets worse and worse and worse until finally that's the end yeah it's yeah. progressive, right? And we it's were dying. We were slowly killing ourselves with food. I, that's what I say about it's, myself. And yeah. in the book, you say sugar triggers the same neurochemistry and neural pathways as cocaine. Yeah. Sweet and chocolate mimics the effects of alcohol and opiates. Yeah. Right? I, I actually think that it's it, for people who, um, uh, because al alcohol is sort of more common in the general world. Um, it. it, it, it I think that if you compare sugar to alcohol, it's a pretty useful one because actually alcohol is just fermented sugar. So it's in mm -hmm. a way, it's the big sister of sugar. And if we just look at the chronic progressive nature of alcoholism, um, it's similar to sh a food addiction. It's just alcohol because there's so much sugar in a bottle of whatever it is you're drinking. Um, it, it's a quicker process, but you die of the same thing. You get liver mm -hmm. cirrhosis, fatty liver disease, diabetes, eventually heart attack. That happens with food too. It just takes a little bit longer because you have to eat it rather than drink the sugar. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you talk about it in the book, and I had this experience where I was drinking too much, got in recovery, I've been sober for almost 11 years, mm -hmm. but then I started eating even more. And That's, so my, you know, and, yeah. and this is a pretty typical pattern, right, that uh, alcoholics go on to something else like food. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly it. And in the treatment yeah. center where I work, where, where we treat alcoholics, it's really interesting how quickly they adapt to a sugar addiction. They, you know, they'll often say to me, I, I can't believe I'm eating so much. I never used to eat this much before I came here. And I think, yeah, because you were drinking and now you're not right. drinking. And so now there's the food and it calls to you in a way that it didn't before you picked up the alcohol. That's right. Yeah. yeah. One of the most interesting things I think in your book was was this, and I think I learned this, that there is a difference in emotional eating and food addiction, or as we say about food, a substance use disorder. Um, but food addiction is different than emotional eating, and not necessarily all food addicts are emotional eaters, and not necessarily all emotional eaters are food addicts. So talk about the difference. Yeah, that is probably the biggest um, controversy or snarl or, or uh, um, 
entanglement that we have to disentangle, even as far as uh, trying to get food addiction acknowledged with the DSM-5 uh, uh, committee, is we have to say, here's how we're different than emotional eating. For example, uh, the, sort of the classic, if it becomes a syndrome in and of itself, that's called uh, an eating disorder. Um, uh, it, how do we make a distinction between that? Like, the, the problem is, is they look the same. So a person is overeating because they're feeling distressed. Um, and so they're eating too much um, all at once and possibly even purging. A food addict will do that too. And so a lot of people who identify as food addicts will say, I was initially diagnosed as uh, having an eating disorder or bul bulimia or binge eating disorder, something like that. Um, and um, there is a difference. Although we always say, all of us, uh, that uh, you can have both conditions, which just makes it even more difficult to disentangle. But the essence, the essence of the difference between them is that uh, emotional eating um, or eating disorder all the way to the end of that bus um, is that you're using food to deal with your emotions. I'm unhappy, you know, my partner just left me or I've lost my job. I'm just going to sit in front of the uh, uh, television and eat and essentially become drunk with the food. And that's not necessarily a food addict. So a food addict will, will do the same behavior when they're distressed, but they'll also do that behavior when they're not distressed. It's just part of their routine. Or it might be, uh, and we say that we see this happening all the time for people. Um, we, it might even be, I don't know how not to have that food. I need, instead of I need that bottle of wine to get to sleep at night, that's the alcoholic story. Um, the, the food addict story is I won't be able to sleep unless I have my tub of ice cream or my plate of, not a plate, a bag plus of cookies. Like I need to have these things just to get right. to sleep. So it, it, it's no longer about emotion. It's about this need to fulfill. Um, otherwise you'll be in distress, with, uh, basically withdrawal, physical withdrawal. You can be as mm -hmm. Happy as ever, you know. Somebody says, "Susan, you know, congratulations, you did a great job. Let's go out for dessert." And and you know, you're going to be thinking, "Yeah," and I'll be sitting at that plate, um, or I'll be thinking about food the rest of. No, I'm not going for you know because you know that it's not going to stop at one. You don't mm -hmm. have to be in distress. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So people that might not have a food addiction but uh, eat emotionally because they have they've lost a job, they're getting going through a divorce, maybe they've yeah. had past. Uh, sexual abuse, you know, they may eat uh, to cope with those feelings. Yes. And once treated, once their emotions are treated, they may or may not go back to food because they're yeah. not food addicts. At, at times, uh, right? Uh, that's right. That's right. Once the once and and, and the uh, eating disorder model or just the regular model um, is okay. Let's talk about what the feelings are behind this, and then you won't need to turn to food. So you're going to resolve your issues eventually, and you'll be fine. You don't need to turn to food anymore. Mm -hmm. Food addict. We yeah. do want to look at psychology, but but um, there we say. Uh, the, the feelings behind that are not the first thing we look at. We have to look at what the food is that's promoting the, the ongoing use, um, get rid of that, and now we'll look at the psychology um, to maintain that, that abstinence, that sobriety. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, uh, let's talk about the DSM-5. Um, I mean, you can uh, diagnostical statistical manual, and it's through the American Psychiatric Association. Yes. Kind of where are we with that? Uh, that uh, substance use disorder, food addiction, substance use disorder is going to be uh, recognized. Oh, it, right. Uh, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's a Hopefully. Constant, yeah, it's a constant yeah. battle. So uh, for people who may not know it, the DSM-5, um, you know, is, is a uh, basically a it's, uh, how do I say this? Um, it's a political, um, there's a conference or there, there's a lot of committees and, and they, and, and of psychiatrists and maybe other people too, um, who get together and they sort of negotiate and decide it, it, it's a consensual, um, set of, well, uh, not guidelines, but of um, uh, uh, diagnoses that are considered to be, um, you know, the, the up the latest of the understanding of uh, psychiatric issues. Uh, but it's it, it, what's really important to know is that it is a um, a lobbying effort, and whoever the body is that's taking it takes that material, like that's at the top, uh, takes that material and then weighs it against what already exists, and uh, on it goes like that. Um, 
and there's a lobbying effort. And the food addiction um, c- community um, has, uh, in the DSM, the new DSM by which came out a number of years ago, um, they they appealed uh, their case, and they were told at that point, yeah, you, you know, sure, there's something wrong with the way people eat, but you have to tell us that it's not. Um, uh, basically an eating disorder because that's what we see it as and they're right it looks like that and we're saying but there's something look at the research that we have that shows there's something different and they're saying not good enough come back the next time we do this and uh, the dsm uh, 5 revised or maybe it'll be the dsm 6 and we're in that process right now of coming back right um yeah. and uh, uh you know we're we have a lot more research but where where my sense is where we're going with this one is that we're, we're going to have to make a choice by saying okay they're not going to buy this model i don't know why they won't buy this model but they're not going to buy this model um so should we then hook on to calling ourselves a subset of an eating disorder which i think would be um uh, not not a great idea because the treatments are different. However, right. expediency, we want to be approved because approval means more research and more uh, insurance for treatment. So I don't know, like uh, we're, we're yeah. at a stage now saying, how can we um, um, position ourselves so that we'll be taken seriously as a separate disorder? Yeah. I know there's a movement afoot. I just talked to Esther this morning and mm-hmm. uh, there are a lot of uh, efforts going forward um, you know, and the Food Addiction Institute, I'm on the board of that. And of course, yes. Esther Helga yeah. is chairman of that. And uh, there, there's a lot of research. So, but it's a very small, small group of people. And let's move on to what you, you talked about earlier. And that is the food industry, yes. the diet industry, the drug industry. There are a lot of big, exercise big money. Industry. Let's add that exercise too. industry, right? Don't forget yeah. Peloton and all that. If you just exercise more, if you just take these diet pills, if you go yeah. to Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, uh, and then the food industry. I mean, you, you know, in my program, I cannot eat something if if sugar is not fifth or beyond on the ingredients label. Sugar yeah. is added to so many things. I can't have ketchup, you know. I mean, so there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of money here. Uh, so talk about the food industry and uh, the lobbying there. Well, um I- I don't. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, you know, you you just said you, you kind of contrasted it really nicely. There's just a few of us, and there's a big them. It's a definitely a David right. and Goliath thing. Um, yes. And uh, it's it, the food industry has there's there has been research actually even since the. Um, I think it's even since the 1990s, the British Medical uh, Journal, I think it's the BMJ, British Medical Journal, yeah, uh, published actually uh, food industry um, uh, where they fund um, universities and professors and researchers and where they um, deliberately... they did a nice review and they, they every once in a while they come up with it and there was something more recently um, in the US as well uh, showing that um, uh, there's actually documentation of um, how the food industry will deliberately either divert the interest again back to blaming the victim or obscure I think it's called obf- obfuscate the research so that the research is is um, not so clear that sugar causes diabetes or sugar causes uh, illness um it's they spend a yeah. lot of money doing this but basically it's being compared to the tobacco industry and what they do yeah it does seem like a conspiracy or subterfuge you mm-hmm. know and uh you cite in the book the u.s centers for disease control and prevention estimates that that by 2030 the year 2030 that almost 84 percent of the U.S. population will be overweight and 42% will be obese. That's like half the population will be obese. And we know that, um, I learned this uh, from Marty Lerner, obesity is a symptom of food addiction. They're not, I mean, it's a symptom of food addiction and substance use disorder. It's not necessarily the same. Right. No, and that's a really important point to make because you we have a lot of people who are normal weight or or underweight who are food addicts. Really, what is mm-hmm. the definition of food addiction? But somebody who's obsessed by food to the point where it's intrusive into the rest of their life, and that they mm-hmm. have behaviors, compulsions that um, uh, damage their normal circumstances, mm-hmm. like they you know don't go into work or 
uh, cancel right. things, that sort of thing. And they simply cannot stop. And that can be anybody. That can be a thin person who's over-exercising. That can be a right. person who's got a secret um, bulimic b- behavior where they, they um, uh, you know, get rid of all the food that they put into their mouth. Mm-hmm. Or, the, or they do all sorts of tricks around eating. It's called sham eating where you eat but you don't really swallow it. Like there's, there's all sorts of things that a yeah. skinny person can do, but they're so yes. many behaviors. Right there, it's just compulsive. It's obsessive compulsive, yeah. kind of like, and it takes so much room in your head. You know, when I've seen people in that suffer from this, and uh, you know, and, and for me, and I think I, I say this for you as well. I was always concerned about how much I was eating and how much I weighed for years, right. you know, for forty three years, and dieting, yeah. and I was good at diets, like you say in the book, you were. Um, let's talk about volume eating and food addicts. Uh, I was a volume eater, uh, large plates full of food. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would make me feel safe uh, when I would eat large plates full and I would sort of numb out yeah. uh, the quality of the food, the crunchy things, soft things like uh, ice cream, comfort foods like mashed potatoes. Talk about that. Yeah, but you know, it could even be um, healthy foods like celery and carrots. Mm-hmm. I know people who have eaten way too many carrots. It, 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 so you're talking about the concept of volume. It really, yeah. what you were describing there was a kind of mix of the volume and as well as the like ice cream is intoxicating. Yeah, the quality in and of, of the food, right? So, so yeah. that's why it's so super easy. But what what actually uh, is happening when you even eat healthy foods, but too many of them? Um, we're not exactly sure uh, what's going on there, but there appears to be a phenomena like i said even of healthy non-addictive foods in and of themselves where the person just needs to eat and you use the classic word to feel safe to numb out and there we're because we're using the concept of this is um uh, an addiction, there's a phenomenon, an external phenomenon that's sort of uh, hijacking or t- taking over our mind. Uh, we're, we're looking at, okay, so what are the neurochemicals that might be ex- exposed? The stretch receptors in the stomach are stretched. And, and you know, we know that there's a lot of serotonin in the stomach. Serotonin is an antidepressant. So you, there you are feeling right. safe and numbed out. It's also, uh, it, it, sometimes people eat to the point of almost pain, but um, it's, it's a, it's a, but it's a n- nice pain, if you will. Uh, it's until you, unless you eat too many, it's basically it's a fine line. But it, there's probably endorphins that are being released too. Um, mm-hmm. and it, dopamine. It, you talk about dopamine in yes. the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it gets all of them, and, and how that interplays and how that actually works is what we're teasing out right now. But there appears to be something that's happening, um, and, and most of the time, people, it's not like in the excitement or thrill. It's like a safe feeling, like you, like you, you really hit it on the head, and that's you know. Uh, our, our, our rest and digest system you know you're eating uh, and there, it's probably keying in um uh, the, a vagal response which has got to do with digestion and vagal response is what you do when you take a deep breath that's how you relax so mm-hmm. you may need to eat a lot to feel that feeling of relaxation Right, and and it may not you may not get that feeling anymore. But when the, the thing about addiction is, it starts off being something that you're chasing because you like the feeling, and it ends up being I'm using this because I don't want to be in withdrawal. So right. it might be that I need to feel full, or I will feel unsafe. I will feel anxious and agitated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, talk about uh, as we go there. Let's talk about late stage food addicts. I was a mm-hmm. late stage food addict. Uh, I had uh, metabolic syndrome, which you talk about, right. high blood pressure, diabetes, and then high cholesterol. Um, I weighed two hundred and three pounds. I really should not have weighed. You know, I should have weighed like one thirty five. Mm-hmm. So talk about the late stage food addict. Like you say, you start. You know, just like when you start drinking, it feels good. Yeah. But then you keep drinking or you keep eating the way we eat uh, to not have withdrawal symptoms. Exactly. So, you know, when people say, um, oh, you, you, you're just overreacting here. What's wrong with having a little bit of something to make you feel better? Like they, they, you're t- they, they may be themselves in early food addiction or they're not understanding what it's like to be in later stage food addiction. Because food addiction, at least in the early stages, is like it's like any other drug. You know, I, I, I'm a, an ex-smoker. I used to love smoking until until I was coughing all the time and I needed that cigarette or else I would feel really agitated. So there's a, so there's a sort of honeymoon period that eventually you move out of and then it's just I don't want to feel uh, the end stage. I don't know any food addict in late stage that's saying, 
I'm, I really, really, really enjoy that chocolate cake. They don't, they don't even taste the chocolate cake as they're shoving yeah. it in their mouth. It, 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 the, the, the pleasure is gone. It's just the feeling. It's that chase of, if I have another cake, maybe it's not chocolate cake. Maybe it's peanut butter cake. Maybe it's something else I need that will take that edge off that I'm chasing, mm-hmm. which is the dopamine. Um, it, sure. it's uh, end stage food addiction is not fun. It's, it's misery. No. It's absolute misery. It's and the person wants to stop, but they can't because what right. will happen is, is they're going to go in abject despair and depression and, and uh, maybe even feel suicidal because now I have to look at myself at the consequences, either weight or di- diabetes, whatever. I don't know how to stop. How do I live with that? It's, it's, it's right. miserable. Yeah, it's uh, the denial is powerful. Uh, the disease is, is uh, and the denial about it is powerful. Even when I look back at old photos, I'm shocked at how far I, you know it went. Uh, but your background, let's talk about your, your own struggle with food addiction. Uh, some of the professionals I've interviewed so far for this podcast, including Esther Helga and Marty Lerner, uh, are not only on the front lines of helping food addicts, but like you and me, uh, they have had experience with uh, addiction. So talk about that. Talk about your background. I think it's really interesting that, that uh, you know, because food addiction is so dismissive and people laugh about it, um, or, and, and, you know, I, I, now it's a little easier because there's so many of us in the field and there's a collegiality. But in the early days, Marty was on his own, I was on my own, Esther was on her own, uh, feeling like, what, what's wrong with us? Um, and and uh, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say here is it's really interesting that those of us who withstood all of those pressures, it's because we had our own story and our own story, yeah. which it was, is the sort of engine that got, got us through all those uh, hard, dark days of, of, of before. Um, and my story was uh, that I, um, like you, I actually got up to 240 pounds. Um, and I was, I was uh, actually not a, 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 I was a fairly small child. Like I wasn't what we say, I didn't come from big numbers. Um, I was actually pretty underdeveloped. Um, but I, once I got uh, to like my early 20s in university, I had this crazy belief, which of course many of us do, that if it's something that the university is offering, when I was an intern in a hospital and saw the foods that were there, I thought, well, it must be healthy because they wouldn't offer it to me otherwise. Um, And and so I used the food to cope uh, and then uh, ended up, uh, because I have a family history of uh, addiction and I also myself drank a lot and then stopped when I got into university or that was Mm -hmm. when I started to stop, uh, I found that food was a really effective way to stop drinking. Um, and smoking pot and yeah. all the other things that we did in those days. Um, right. And uh, uh, anyway, I found that food was my answer. And then I discovered, like, as I said uh, uh, earlier, it, it, I, it was my answer, whether I was happy, sad, glad, whatever, it didn't matter what. It became something that I was dependent on, like I was with, on my pack of cigarettes. Um, and then uh, I, when, it, when it started to become very unhappy making i had crossed that line so that i i never actually got to pre-diabetes but i definitely got to obesity um uncomfortable obesity like the kind where i had a cane a a nice walking stick to help me walk around i mean i just i made it an affected like a beautiful walking stick i'm just using it but basically i don't use that walking stick anymore because i it it slows me down i want to walk now right Um, so um uh, anyway that's that's my story and then it yeah. actually because i'm in the addiction field um i became aware of addiction addiction and concepts and it just hit me one day like it hit marty on his own one day and esther on her own one day mm-hmm. oh my god this let's treat this like an addiction and when yeah. i did that it was like that was the answer that was the answer yeah. but it's we, a hero's uh, work yeah it's, yeah it's, it's, it's I just uh, respect the work you guys do, and uh, you have the experience, personal experience. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you make a nice acknowledgement of Esther Helga, and I know that you teach uh, at the Infact School. You taught uh, one of her first uh, sessions, uh, mm-hmm. so uh, and she respects you a lot. Uh, an excerpt from uh, what you say about her. Uh, about Esther Helga Goodman's Dotier, your program in Iceland, the Infact School, was one of the first of its kind and remains a stellar example of how mm-hmm. food addiction services can be provided. Absolutely. So high praise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, Esther's program, uh, I think it, was, it wasn't the first, but it was one of the first. It was the first one, I think, to include uh, like high... 
high um, uh, caliber speakers, not just me. <laughs> but, you, know, Lustig, <laughs> you are <laughs> Robert Lustig, Nicole yeah. Avina, like like people who are in the field, highly respected uh, in in their area. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, she she got them to come to there, and she's con continuing to accumulate people like that. So that that means that the student um, is exposed to. The real research, and so this isn't like food coach that you pick up off the internet because they're going to promise you weight loss. You know you're getting good quality uh, material from the food addiction front lines, as it were. And mm -hmm. I, I really want, I continue to support Esther's uh, program because that's a goal of hers. I know that there's others now starting up here and there or other ways, uh, but hers continues to be uh, amongst the top, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, let's talk about recovery. Uh, I'm a, like, like you, I'm a recovered food addict. I dieted for 43 years, uh, succeeded and failed over and over. I got into, we talk about 12-step recovery. Mm -hmm. I got into 12-step recovery, and uh, I've maintained a weight loss of 70 pounds. But mm. um, there's a statement you make in the book. It says, obesity, cross addictions, diabetes, depression can be aver averted if food addicts simply get off the bus of their yeah. addiction sooner rather than later and then really get these trigger foods out of their lives and get a good food plan. So we're going to talk about that. Okay. Well, you know, that's the, the, that's, that's the piece. And now you mentioned denial. And the thing is, is by the time, like I'm in recovery and I didn't need to try again because I'd already tried everything. I tried all the diets and tried the, uh, uh, um, things that were out there. So, so for me, it was like once I got the concept that this is food addiction, and like you, I found a twelve-step program which gave me a plan of action. Um, and we can talk more about what else it gave me because I think that's really important. Um, but one thing I didn't need to be convinced about was that if I go back, I'm going to pick up again, and it'll be worse. The people who are early on, they don't have that experience, and so they're like, "Why you, you're going to ask me to never have this again?" Like to me, it's like. Right. Yes. If it means freedom from the, the, the obsession, I'm happy to let it go forever. But early days for people, it's like, nah, our sense of denial is, this is what we call hitting bottom. You have to really want to yes. do those steps because otherwise the addict mind will always say, it's not that bad. Um, I know in the but in my bones that it is that bad and so I'm not going to pick up again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, that's a, essentially one piece of recovery is knowing that you, you that the concept of abstinence you have to identify what are the foods almost always i would say 99.9% .9 is sugar um, sugar uh, and uh, basically anything that has been highly processed or highly refined mm -hmm. is is up for grabs for being an addiction um, identify the trigger foods with your counselor your coach your whatever your sponsor right. whatever it is um, and then remove those until you get the gauge is not weight loss it's like, like, you no, don't want it's to not use a diet. Products. No, it's not. It's, am I now no longer obsessed about food? I, I still look forward to my lunch and my dinner or whatever, but I'm not thinking about it in between me. I'm, essentially, we have a life in between our meals, an entire life um, that is not, uh, uh, you know, couched by food thoughts. Um, right. And, we're free. Yeah. We're free of the thoughts. We'll talk about exactly. that a little bit later. And exactly. when the uh, when the when, when I stopped, and I, maybe when you stopped, there is a te detoxification process that goes yes. on. And yes. you say it's one to four weeks, and it's hard, you know, to yeah. get rid of sugar. It took me a while to really get rid of it, and my body just transformed. Uh, but you have to get through that as you're working. As you're working the 12 steps, we're abstinent from those trigger foods, right? Yes, uh, talk yes. about that detox period. Yeah. When, when I was working uh, at Renaissance and they had that three-year um, program, I, I got to see how um, the a detox worked in relation to the other people in the in the program that were detoxing from alcohol and cocaine and whatnot. And it was a very similar process, a very similar timeline. You know, the first week people are in, they're freaking out, how am I going to not have that tub of ice cream at night? I won't be able to sleep. Um, and uh, similarly, like the people who are no longer, you know, drinking alcohol um, were really anxious. There may not have been the same physical withdrawal um but it was still there a subtle one people have diarrhea they have anxiety they're sweating they're feeling nauseous 
um, fatigue. Yeah, yeah, I had fatigue, a lot of fatigue. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's still there. It's not as dramatic as the opiate user who stopped, but it's still there. And right. um, uh, what we say with pretty all, all, much all addictions is that first what we call post-acute withdrawal is about three weeks or so. Uh, some people, it's less. They're lucky. They'll say, you know, I feel better after day six. Wow. And others are like, no, I'm still. But by the time the month was over, because it was a month-long program, people were like, I'm never going to touch that stuff again. I feel so much better. However, and we have to talk about, you know, what happens later. Uh, you know, if they pick up again, uh, then it, it's back to square, not quite square one, but it's back to um, being in the addiction. Yeah. Uh, but if they can actually abstain, pure abstinence, it doesn't take that long. Um, uh, but it is pretty miserable. So in that, in that month where they were locked up, they had access to counselors at 11 at night or even two in the morning when they woke up. Um, if you're on your own, um, we would definitely say join some kind of an outpatient thing. Um, if you can do an intensive, do an intensive. And if you can't do any of that, you have to get support. Like, it, you can't mm -hmm. do this alone. It, the addict right. is shrieking inside of your head for at least seven yeah, days. Yeah, um, we're going to talk about recovery programs, but but before that, I want to talk about food plans and mm. uh, you know what do you eat if you don't eat processed foods and. Uh, I worked with a dietitian, a nutritionist, and she said, when we started with how much should you weigh? I should weigh about 135. Mm -hmm. Okay, how are we going to get 70 pounds off? Here's what you should eat to weigh 135. Mm -hmm. And I eat five to six times a day, five times a day right now. And uh, it's a combination of veg a lot of vegetables, uh, a little bit of starch, fats, protein, fruits. There are different food plans. Uh, mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, and, and I have freedom from food thoughts. I have neutrality now. Talk about food plans and what people eat if they don't eat sugar and processed foods. Yeah, th th this is a really good example of how the food industry has snowed us into thinking that food is, is basically industrial food products that are sold yeah. at, at our grocery stores. You just have to go to your local farmer's market and just eat real food. Like, like yeah. my food plan that I suggest is anything that is not industrial and <laughs> that doesn't have right. a label or if it does have a label that there's, you know, just a few ingredients on that label. Like it, it's, it's, it, it, it you know, I could say, hey, keto works really well or, or plant or what I could say, but it's not necessary. You just you just pick the plan that suits you, suits your eth ethnic background, suits your tastes, which, by the way, right. will change anyway. They will change. And just mm -hmm. find out what those trigger foods, remove them. I like your idea of going to a dietitian, or, but it has to be a, a, an astute one, one that gets food addiction. Right. But right. Um, find somebody that can actually tell you the nutritional value of stuff because you're not going to want to eat a lot of something that has no nutrition or very little, um, you know, like find the, the power foods, whatever they are. Um, right. and, uh, remove the trigger foods and then you've got your food plan that works for you. And some people, you mentioned volume addiction will actually have to portion control, uh, as part of their food plan. But once you do that, uh, you know, like a portion controlled. So for an extreme food addict end stage, they likely will have to do some sort of portion control and their, and their yeah. food choices are probably more limited than an early stage. But mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you're not looking at that person going, Oh my God, how can you eat that horrible stuff? They're saying, you know what? I feel so free and I enjoy the foods that I'm eating. I'm not feeling deprived at all. You might right. think I am, but I'm not. Yeah, I, I yeah. love my foods, and uh, I weigh and measure everything in my yeah. program, and uh, I have to because I, I, I can't really be trusted to what is four ounces, what is five ounces. I have to weigh it, and that's right. my commitment to this program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't eyeball it because I will give me an inch, I'll take a mile. Yeah. Um, let's that's talk about recovery that's program. Yeah, yeah, it's that's not the you, addict it's in the me. Addict. Yeah. I, I am, I am wildly aware. <laughs> Uh, but there's freedom. We're going to talk about that at the end. You talk about recovery programs. Renaissance is one. Um, I went through sort of a leadership program for a while with Shift, previously Acorn, yes. Bill Wardell and Mary uh, Fushi's uh, group. Another, uh, Amanda another, Lee. Giant, another uh, set of giants in the field. Early right. Pioneers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Milestones in recovery. Marty Lerner uh, has a, a place in, in uh, Southeast Florida. So, um, we talk about 12-step recovery um, without mentioning, you know, the organizations, of course, uh, in respect for the traditions. But uh, we have to get to the bottom of why, you know, what is causing us to eat. Now, food addiction is one thing, substance use disorder, but 
with recovery, it's not a diet. So we have to get to the reasons, right? Talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Well, the, the, the programs that you mentioned, uh, there, there's very few in-house programs. And part of the reason is because uh, people can't afford them. And you can't open up a program, say I'm a food addiction program, and then hope that insurance will cover you. Until the DSM-5 accept, um, accepts us, it's not That's happening. Right. So what, right. what we're seeing now are a few programs like Marty's program um, uh, where they are uh, – taking a model, a f uh, eating disorder, and making a subsection, a space for food addicts and calling it an eating disorder with an addiction subset. Um, mostly what we see is like what you mentioned, shift, uh, like a five-day intensive um, where uh, it, it, it is kind of like residential because you find a place and then you're all intense for five days, but it's not like a nice month long or three months. That would be ideal. And then there's right. a few other programs that are outpatient but highly intense. Yeah, like, yeah. like Sugar RX is one and you just okay. type this up um sweet sobriety is a new one um uh, there's there's uh sandra elia in, in uh, toronto ontario has another one they're all sort of intensive um either over like uh, once a week but three times a day uh, um, follow up or literally three times a day zoom meetings um, something super intense that um will um give you that extra almost minute by minute support now you mentioned 12 step programs which will do the very same thing because a lot of the food ones are very intense you have to be in touch with your sponsor every day you have to call three people a day you're doing a lot That's of me. stuff yeah yeah That's uh, but uh, so for people who are open to 12 step you can do everything that we just talked about for free but these other options are sort of secular alternatives uh, where you pay a bit of money but then you get a very similar type of uh, intense support mm -hmm. and I've got to say you need I think that with addiction, especially food addiction, where there's so many temptations out there in the world, we need to have that intensity of support. It's an intense yeah. addiction. <laughs> we need intense it recovery. Is. And yeah. food is everywhere. Birthday parties, uh, celebrations. Yeah. We celebrate. We, you know, go out and like, Mom, can you have just a bite of cake? No, I can't. You know, yeah. it's it's just. Uh, but I'm it's not just, neutral it's to not it. It's not just. Can you have one? But like, what's wrong with you? Why won't you? You know, Why it's your birthday. You? Uh, right. You know, I, I made it for you. Like we get. It's not just um, that it's there in the face, but we're constantly the like, food pushers pushed into taking it. A lot of people will eat it just because they don't know how to say no. Right. Yes, I know, yeah. know people like that. Yeah. Um, this has been very good. I uh, a couple more things. Um, you know, there is freedom uh, with uh, recovery from food addiction. I have it. And I can mm -hmm. tell you have it. I read it, your book. And mm -hmm. um, I don't think about food. I don't think about my weight anymore. And I have this life where I can run around with my grandkids and I can hike the Grand Canyon and, and do things I could never have done before. Wow. And I was slowly killing myself with food. So yeah. I have recovered and uh, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, what would you say to someone who is listening and thinks that he or she might be a food addict? What uh, what hope would you give them? Uh, well, I would say, first of all, um, uh, that the, the shaming can end right now, that you are not alone. There are many of us finally being heard and listened to. I mean, I've been speaking for a long time. Esther has, you know, all of us uh, who have been around for a while, but we haven't had the social media platform that, that we could tell people. A lot of people, the first thing they say is, I'm not alone. Oh, my God. So you're not alone. And then second thing is, there is a solution. Now that you, because there's a problem and we know what the problem is and we have suggestions. They may not work perfectly. We may have to tweak it and figure out what works for you specifically, but we have a general principle of what to do and there are more and more people so the first thing i would say is good for you you're not alone and there is hope um mm -hmm. uh, and, and so just hang in there and then the next thing i would say is um just get the support that you need if you don't want to spend money then join a 12-step group but it, it might be worth spending the money it's not like you're going to be doing this the rest of your life uh, th this first week this first uh, right. post-acute withdrawal do what you need to to get through that first three weeks it's the hardest it will be um, but it's definitely not as hard as you being an addiction by the way because by the end of it you're miserable most people mm -hmm. are miserable. I was miserable. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if it meant that I had to uh, fork out a few thousand dollars, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about 20,000, I'm talking about a few, to get some support, intense support, 
I would do that. Now, I have no problem with the 12-step program, so I was willing to do that. Um, right. Anyway, so so do what you have to do to get through, uh, and then because it's it's time limited, it's like up up to max four weeks. Then after that, after that, um, still stay in the game um, with supports, maybe a weekly support or a daily uh, coach sponsor, whatever, right. so that you're right. reminded. To, to not pick up again, because then you're just going to go back and be in that mess again. Right. You yeah. want to stay on the other side. You want to. You, you don't want to get back on the bus. Um, but there's going to be a lot of people pushing you to get back on that bus, and you're going to need <laughs> support. We are highly, highly, highly socially um, influenced, and so we have to build what I call like a social bubble to support, support us network. so that yeah. I don't go on the bus because I'm happy here. Thank you very much. But if all my friends are on that bus, this is the same thing that happens yeah. with a guy who gets yeah. out of jail, and, and he's like, I'm never going use drugs again but there he is he's on his own uh and and all of his friends are still on that bus he's going to go back on that bus because we're social right. we need people so you have to find new people yeah. a new tribe and, you, and we are a yeah. new tribe <laughs> we are yeah and you have to find your own bottom and it took me a while to get to yes, my bottom i know exactly. it did, did with you and they say that these programs that we're talking about are not for people who need it but for people who want it and right. I, I wanted it very badly, and yes. I, I know you did too. But uh, it's been wonderful to host you today on the Food Addiction Podcast, Dr. Vera Tarman. Thank you. And uh, your book is excellent, uh, Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. You can find it on Amazon. You have a great uh, podcast uh, with you and the others, Food Junkies. You can find that. Uh, and I know you wanted to mention a Facebook group at the yes. end. Yeah, I have a, a Facebook group, which is free. It's called I'm Sweet Enough, Sugar Free for Life. And um, if you're uh, wanting to keep support, you want to give support to other people, which, by the way, is keeping your own support, um, it's it's a it's a great, vibrant community of people, lots of newcomers coming on saying, what, what do I eat if I don't eat sugar? You know, uh, yeah. all the way to people saying, hey, I got 30 years. Uh, so it's a, it's a great mm -hmm. little community, which is yeah. great. And it's called list. I'm Sweet Enough. Sugar Free for Life. Sugar Free for Life. All right. I think I've already joined, but I'll make sure I did. Actually, we have a PDF of various programs on that Facebook group. Just join and ask for it. Yeah, and Esther has them on her In Fact School website, too. A lot of 12-step right. programs and recovery right. programs as well. So. And, if, and if there's yeah. anybody who uh, wants to be in the field and work in the field, let's do another pitch for Esther. Esther's program, In Fact program, is great. It Highly is. It's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Vera, for joining Thank me you. today. It's been Thank wonderful. You, this is the Food Addiction Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the podcast and learned more about this disease. We hope you will rate and write a review on this podcast and share it with others. If you or someone you know is suffering from the disease of food addiction, there is a solution. The various food addiction recovery programs are available and listed on the website, theinfactschool.com. Or if you would like to know more about how to get certified in treating food addiction, the school is accepting applications now for its next training beginning in September 2023. Go to theinfactschool.com. That's I-N-F-A-C-T school.com to learn more.